it took me later on to realize I spoke to more people that some of the deals I passed on were absolutely deals. They just weren't, they just weren't his buy box. And I started to learn, oh, he's not the market, he's a buyer, right? And then I started to learn there's different sorts of buyers. You know, you got your landlords, you got your flippers, you got your, you know, people that do high end, people that do lease, also, lease, lease options. So All right, we are here with Steve Keery, self-proclaimed Aussie Steve. So first off, I know you're, you're a wholesaler and this is a real estate podcast, but I got to start with how the hell did you end up in New Orleans from Australia? Because that is quite the jump culturally, geographically, like everything about that just seems like a complete upside down turn. Yeah, it's funny. I came here on a vacation uh, and never left. Um so, I mean, I was inspired by Robert Kiyosaki. I'm a big fan of his. And one of his books is Retire Young, Retire Rich. And that was all about when he sold his first business. One of his business associates really insisted he took a year off and did nothing. So uh, I, I was taking a year off and doing nothing. And we love America. We've been in 28 states. You know, we really love it. But New Orleans is our favorite city. So we decided to come for six months um, just for fun, we had our kid in school, we enrolled her for a semester here and man, we had no intention of moving here. But about two months in, my wife just said to me, you know, we're not leaving, Steve. <laughs> figure that out, <laughs> just figure that out. Um, and I did, wow. and I, got, I looked at the real estate market and I loved what I saw because I liked real estate. Uh, so it was, a, it was a mix of just loving the culture, food, just, just how, what a fun city this is, but then mixed with um, business opportunities, the cost of property being way cheaper here than I, I, Sydney is the second most uh, least affordable city in the world uh, for real estate. So wow. to shift here was a, actually a big advantage for me. Uh, and then the business side was better as well. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, so you discovered it even like a little bit later in life. Because I feel like a lot of people that move to New Orleans, they're like, I can party. <laughs> Marty and stuff's right. cheap here. So I'm going <laughs> to stay. But you actually made an uncivilized yeah. adult decision and went there as a family and still decided to it was, it was still mixed with a party. And it's a fun place for an adult here. It's a fun place for an adult. <laughs> for but, sure. you know, the kids like yeah. it here too. Yeah, <laughs> awesome, man. No, that, that's very cool. And, yeah. and so, I mean, how, how long ago was that? How long uh, have you been up there Four and a half years ago. Four and a half years. Four and a half years ago. Oh, yeah. so pretty recent. Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. That's awesome. So I guess to, to pre, like, like looking before that, you know, obviously you're a, is a real estate wholesaler now in the New Orleans area, but what were you doing in Australia? Because that's also something else that isn't really common there, I don't think, especially I know real estate just in general outside of the United States tends to work a little bit. There. Yeah, I mean, so the, what did that life look like? Before? So the real estate market in Australia uh, is not great for investors. Uh, I, I did invest a little bit. So I guess, I guess to sort of frame my background, again, I'm a Kiyosaki fan. I, I saw him speak in 2000 when um, I was at university. I was studying marketing and economics at the time. And I was never into seminars. I wasn't into any of that stuff. I thought I was going to be, you know, an employee, get like a good job. And man, my, just everything changed that day. Just my whole mindset opened, the whole door opened. And I filled it with like all of his information and other information. Um, and Robert Kiyosaki always said, start a business, you know, get on the B side of the quadrant, the business quadrant and invest in real estate. So that was my path. So I didn't start with real estate. I started with business. You know, I never got a full, I've never had a full-time job in my life. That's one of my claims to fame. Uh, I did some part-time work. So like I've worked, but nothing full-time. When I finished university, I started my own business. Um, I was, was in marketing. I was consulting with small businesses. I, I met a business partner doing something similar. And we merged our companies and had a little niche. And then we merged with another company um, which was more tech based. Um, and you know, that company, we grew to 300 staff, it listed on the Australian stock exchange. Um, so, you know, it did really well. Um, and I started buying properties probably halfway through that business journey. You know, as I started to get more income myself, I would buy investment properties. You know, like I said, Sydney, where I lived was the least affordable city, second least, second least affordable city in the world. So I didn't buy where I lived because it was super, super expensive and the rent relative to the, to the like value is ridiculously low. So I always rented where I lived and I bought properties in other areas around Australia. Um, you know, I owned in six, I ended up buying six properties over three different states. Uh, they were basically neutrally cash flow. So, which is a really good investment for Australia. It's actually hard to find the neutrally cash flow property. Um, 
because really? most people will lose money um, every month. It's just it's just how it works, unfortunately. Um, I actually sold a couple last month. I actually sold three of those properties. I, I made a good profit, good capital gain. So I basically kept it. It's, it's sort of like a slow flip, really. Um, but I was into that property, um, so I started doing it there. Then in the business, you know, we really grew like a good 300 staff, we were like a real professional company, um, and it didn't need me. You know, I sort of made myself redundant. You know, we'll get into higher levels. You know, I looked after marketing and we did a lot of online marketing, mm-hmm. but we will going into doing television. And to be honest, like that wasn't my skill. You know, I could replace myself with someone better, more adapt, you know, at that. So that's why I sold some of my shares, but I still had a bunch. Um, and that was when I did the whole, you know, Kiyosaki, take a gap year. Uh, and that's when I came to New Orleans. And I started to look at property and I actually bought a property to get part of my visa, you have to invest in a company. So cause I got a business investment visa. So I bought a property in Lafayette, Louisiana, um, and I bought it for a wholesaler. And I had no idea what a wholesaler was. Like I'd never heard of it. I don't know if they exist in Australia. I don't think they do, or I, I'd never been exposed to them. Um, and I'm like, okay, so wholesalers have the deals. Let me learn what these dudes do um, so that I can be a good customer for them. So. I went to a one day course from Vina Cox Jones. She's from Ohio, uh, but she was in New Orleans. And I did a one day course on wholesaling. And she just started talking about pulling data, marketing, sales. And I, I ran I ran sales uh, and marketing at the company. So like I had sales people, scripts, like everything she said was like, that's what I do. Like that, that <laughs> this is my skill set, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that really just, that was like all the alarms bell went off and I went, well, I'm going to do wholesaling like as my in, like, cause that's my skill. So I just went all in and wholesaling. I like did a bunch of courses, listened to all the podcasts, just really niche down into wholesaling. Um, and that's when I started growing here. And, you know, I've added since doing wholesaling, I do buy myself. I have burrs as well, but I spent a good year and a bit just wholesaling. And that gave me a lot of confidence on what a deal was, what a deal wasn't. You know, I really learned from my buyers. Like, man, they taught me so much because I'm dealing with all these sophisticated buyers and I'm seeing how they view properties. I'm seeing they take different approaches and that gave me confidence to buy. And now I run a hybrid model, which I think is really powerful. If you want to buy properties, if you wholesale and buy properties, you control the deals. Because wholesaling isn't investing, right? Like, I think, I think I do separate those two things. My wholesaling company, it's a sales and marketing company, right? It's, it's just sales yeah, and marketing. For sure. Yep. But I do invest too because I, I have these rentals. So I, I sort of do the wholesaling, that pays the bills, it pays the marketing, and then I also do the investing with my burrs and I, I run them both. Nice. Yeah, yeah that, that's awesome. And I, I think that there's a really valuable lesson there of – and this is something that people ask us all the time if they are want to get into investing or they're like inquiring. We have a group coaching program for the Instant Investor Program. People always inquire about that. And they say, I don't have a lot of real estate experience. Like, can I do what you do? And you didn't have a ton of yes. experience. You had a little bit limited knowledge, right? But you had, you know, just one portion of the skill set that you need, which you came honestly, to a foreign everyone, country. Yeah, yeah I came from a foreign country. But, but, and you understood the basic concept of data and marketing, yeah. and you're able to turn that into a wholesale business, right? And pretty much everybody has some form of the skill set that you need that's involved in it. Like, I guess unless, like, I don't know, you've been a professional I don't know who am I going. Who am I going to shit on right now? A fry cook, know. like that might be difficult. Not even a fry cook because you've bit. probably got hustle. Like, like a, yeah, honestly a, though, right? You probably have the work ethic to get stuff. Yeah, done. exactly. Yeah, that's like, and you said it, Steve. It's like it's a wholesale. The wholesaling is a sales and marketing company, and then there's like Mike, you're saying there's just different tiers of what you have to do within that business to make it successful, and you can be really good at certain parts of the business and still be successful. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be good exactly. at all of them, which is what Mike and I have found out over the years. You can hire and the stuff any- you're not good at. Exactly. And I'd say if anything, it's almost better if you don't have a really in-depth real estate background because then you get too sure. tied up in the asset oh, yes. and not on the parts that actually make you money as an off-market investor, yeah. which is the sales. hundred percent agree with that. And it's definitely my real estate knowledge was limited and it wasn't what it was the sales and marketing and learning more about it from wholesaling and using the knowledge I had um, was what created the business. And I made the mistake when I started, uh, like I didn't understand how different buyers were. And I think for a wholesaler who's starting, mm-hmm. like you want to get with some of the buyers in your area. And I did that. I sort of had like one good buyer and like I was essentially looking for properties for them. 
and it helped me a lot and I did my first deal with them and like I learned so much from them but it it took me later on to realize I spoke to more people that some of the deals I passed on were absolutely deals they just weren't they just weren't his buy box and I started to learn oh he's not the market he's a buyer right and then I started to learn there's different sorts of buyers you know you got your landlords you got your flippers you got your you know people that do high end people do lease also lease, lease options so you know i think that was the biggest lesson that like so i think if you are a real estate investor and you know one style it's hard because you're looking you're looking for that deal and mm -hmm. for wholesaling you need to know these are the different buyers because i'm looking for distress i'm not looking for a property now i want distress i know the price it needs to be if the price is right i can move it and but when i have that deal some buyers are going to look and go no way that's not I, I would never buy that but I have the buyers that like that sit in that criteria. So as long as you have a range of different buyers, you can do any deal that the, where the numbers work. Um, so I do think it actually is an advantage not to be too, too detailed in your own way of uh, real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's even more um, relevant now too as the market started to turn a little bit as well. You have to find those key, those key buyers because. I guess for lack of a better term, all the suckers have left the market, right? All the people that don't know what they're doing, you could sell kind of a crappy deal yep. to last year, which of course, <laughs> you know, we, we would never do that on purpose. No, they want to buy yeah. their business, right? <laughs> but you know, we all, we all know the game, right? Um, but uh, now if you have those key buyers, you can start to create deals as opposed to having to find them. And more often than not, they aren't necessarily deals that you as an investor would want to buy because everyone has their own buy box. Um, but no, that, that, that's really interesting though, Steve. So I would love to hear, I guess, that is a common thing that people ask us is about finding buyers. So what, it, so, it sounds like that's almost like where you started your business was you went from like the buyer side and you work backwards a little bit, or at least that's kind of what you do. Now. I think I, did, I sort of started because I had a few buyers I did, but I think that was sort of a mistake, um, you okay. know, uh, because it was too limited a pool, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually, in terms of starting, I think the best way to start is to find the sellers and do a couple of joint ventures with an existing wholesaler in your market, you know, cause I sort of did, but I, I sort of, Jay, I sort of was linked to a buyer, which disadvantaged me because I had one, um, one view of the world. I think if you're starting out, if you link with a wholesaler who has a bunch of buyers, then you get good at finding the deals and then they can, you, you JB them and move them. And you both get paid, do that a couple of times, build your, uh, credibility, your confidence, and then find your own buyers. That's the way I would recommend doing it um, because the problem is, right, everyone, like as a buyer, I'm a buyer too, right? And like wholesale, even me, like wholesale, oh, can I put in my buyer's list? It's like, yeah, I'm like, just in my head, I'm like, you're never going to send me a deal. It's good. You know? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> totally. Cause, cause, yes. you know, but when you've yes. done a few deals, it's different. You know, like, like so mm -hmm. personally, I think that's the way to do it. You know, how did I build my buyer's list? I did it a few ways. I did a few good moves um, on that. Um, definitely networking. I think network is important. Going to meetups you know, uh, is really important. Uh, it's not as you can't start instantly, you know, but like you need to start actually meeting people. Don't be just an email being sent out, actually know people. So I did a bunch of that and always, okay. I've always been doing that. I did do, um, I did some, I, I bought a database off an existing wholesaler. So I had an existing wholesaler who I was friends with. They needed some cash. We'll sort of, I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'll buy a database. I'm like, I'll give you cash right now. I like solve your crash cards doesn't cost you anything like so I did that I did a few database swaps where you know some of the smaller guys like I had some buyers they had some buyers and we did do them and swapped them um, and then I just went you know obviously bigger pockets like found buyers off that buyers off Facebook groups um, you know uh, so I sort of I combined all the LinkedIn you know I sort of combined all those things together is sort of where I got got my buyers list from um, yeah I don't think we've ever talked to like Mike and I have heard about it, but we've never talked to anybody on the podcast that's ever bought or swapped. I love that idea. Bought or swapped a list from another wholesaler. They, they, they're powerful. Now, they really helped me. It really jumped me up, you know, and, it, and it, it's just like dealing with sellers. Like, like the, the person I bought it from, like I had a good relationship with them and it was a deal of work because I, I like they need that they, they really helped them to get that money for nothing. Like it didn't cost them anything. Um, and then the swaps work. I recently swapped one in, to someone in a different market. So uh, they're actually in the Baton Rouge market and they're trying to get into New Orleans mm -hmm. and they've been there for like 12, they're, they're really old school. They like got a really great database. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to crack my market and I want to go into their market. I'm like, 
let's swap our databases. Now, inst- instantly, that person is really powerful in New Orleans and I'm really powerful in Baton Rouge, you know? And it's like, that's win-win, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating yeah. because a lot of people would say, why would I give a potential competitor an edge or a leg up? I'd love to get your perspective on that because it sounds like that's not an issue for you. So I'm really, I'm really into the go-giver. Uh, and if you know the Go Giver book, um, I'm into that abundance mindset. I, I, it, it's it's not competition in that sense, particularly for a buyer. The buyers need to be able to make a living flipping, right? There's not, mm-hmm. there's a few buyers that can only do like five deals a year, you know. But look, they're hungry, right? Like, like they need to be fed. I, like, I'm not gonna be their sole source of leads. I'm never gonna be their sole source of leads. You know what I mean? Like, like they need other leads, so it doesn't hurt me for them to sell to my buyer, it really doesn't. In fact, it can actually help me because if they buy a deal, they do well, they buy more, they stay in business. Like, so I'm not scared of that at all. You know, I, I help run a meetup in our market and I'm always bringing my buyers, I'm connecting them with them. I'm like, hey, like get, get this whole, so like, like we just work together and I I find with that attitude, it just, it, it you help this person, this person helps you. It's not transactional, it's not, it's, the database swaps are full swaps. But I also just believe in, like, I'll help anyone. And I believe the universe will pay me back. Doesn't, that person doesn't pay me back, the universe will pay me back. And I've really found that's helped me, particularly in America. Like, coming here, I knew zero people. And I now have a really, really strong network. Like, like, like I'm actually amazed at what a strong network I have in New Orleans. Uh, and I think it's just because it's that attitude, that giving. And it just, it just, it just, I don't know, man, that's just where I come from. And... I don't need, yeah. I don't need them not to do a deal. They're not, there's enough room for all of us. We're not in some ultra competitive, you know, mm-hmm. winner take all market. Uh, I think we all exist together yeah. we do deals together. Mm-hmm. I think a big part of that too is like, you know, game recognizes game, right? So like if, if you look at wholesalers in terms of the real estate investor sphere as general, honestly, we're kind of like the. I would say like the top athletes because we are the source of opportunity for a lot of people. Right. And so like when you are like that with like another person, you know, it's like, it's like athletes in, you know, like a sporting event, you have like LeBron and Steph Curry going up against each other. They give each other the nod. They're like, we are the best. And we know that everyone else here is supporting us and we couldn't do business without them, (laughs) but they go at each other a little bit different and they have a little bit more of an acknowledgement than they do of like a, I don't know. Give me a C level basketball player. No one, no uh, one knows. No one cares. No one knows. But, like <laughs> no one knows them. You're right. <laughs> but but like cares? honestly though, as as a yeah. wholesaler, if you look at the real estate community as a whole, because how many flippers does every market have? How many real estate like buy and hold people does every market have? Mm-hmm. Shit, tons of them. Everyone yeah. does on some capacity. But how many true wholesalers that are doing consistent deals at volume on a monthly basis are there in every market? Not very many. You know, even in the biggest markets, you can probably count them you know, on some number of appendages. That is, that's, that's true. Yeah, there's, there's lots of mm-hmm. people, but there's very few yeah. that are, have the consistent deals. Right. And I mean, wholesaling is funny. And, and, and let me talk on it on this level because I think a lot of people do, they try to start in wholesaling and that's fine, you know, because it like, takes less capital and I get that. Uh, but not a lot of people like actually trying to make a long-term business, right? Mm-hmm. I came at it from a business perspective. Yeah. I'm like, I've got sales and marketing. I want to make a business. I want to create a brand. I want to do this long term. And I do want to buy. I'm a buyer. But I get like being able to wholesale means I can always market. I can spend money on marketing. I can monetize the leads I don't want. And I can keep the leads that are, I keep the easy ones, right? I don't keep, all my deals are good that I send out. They're all good deals, right? But like the ones I keep are good deals that need like very little work. And that's you super hard to find. Like you, you really got to find them yeah. yourself. You know, the other ones I sell, like, yeah, they, I'm, cause I'm not a rehabber. Like I want, I want to just, yeah, I change the paint, carpet, paint it, done. And it's undervalued. So, so I, for me, like I'm really creating a wholesaling business. I intend to be doing this in five years, 10 years, you know, like, like, like this is a proper business for me. And I, I think some people could do it. They don't even want to, they, you know, but I would say if you really want to be in real estate and if you have a sales and marketing like if you like that, keep doing it. Make a business. Like do mm-hmm. do them together. It's powerful to do them together. It is. Wow. Yeah, cool. yeah. And I, I think that that's a that's a huge question as well. Sorry, Dan, are you about to say something? I no, go you. ahead. No, we're good. Um, but uh, yeah, and and I I think that 
you know, as, as you're, as people sort of like develop that, that skill set as to uh, that skill set as well, if you're talking about of like learning how to combine those two mediums is where it becomes super, super powerful to get into it. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'd love to hear just more about how your business operates in general. One of my favorite things when we have people on the show is when we have other wholesalers, right. Just hearing about how their businesses work, you know, I guess mm-hmm. what's your main source of deals? What does your team look like? What are the nuances of your market? Because there's always a lot of similarities, but it's always like more different than you would sometimes expect with this little right. ways. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start with the nuances. New Orleans is notoriously hard to operate, like particularly for like national players and like because it's, it's, it's a funky market. And what I mean by that is like you, you cannot use a – you can't go comps. 0.5 mile radius you like you cannot do that like mm-hmm. you we change block to block right like uh, wow. a house can be like across the street it's not a comp if it's a main street so so that's probably the biggest nuance in new orleans it is really hard any national players that come here there's notorious to get their deals wrong uh and i had to learn that like you need to keep really tight no radius you need to draw a comp based on not crossing the main streets so it's probably the biggest nuance and makes it probably the hardest, like hard um, to, to operate in this market. But you can figure that out. Um, and I'll talk to team. I mean, I have I have a VA that does my comps. Um, so they're based in the Philippines. Um, so they will they've been trained to draw that map, pull all the comps. Um, they put them in a spreadsheet for us. Um, you know, I have an acquisition specialist. So she's like she deals with all the seller side stuff. So she's like, you know, taking inbound calls, she's doing follow ups she'll do some cold calls. Like she's dealing with the sellers. Um, we might be a little different to most of but she'll also do it. She'll, she'll do with the sellers. Uh, and we will um, hear what, we'll hear the motivation, we'll hear the story, we'll find out about the property, we'll do a few tricks to figure out like what they want to sell it at you know, the lowest and we'll try to like, we'll try to get them negotiate against themselves and she'll take that information in our CRM. That's the, the, our VA will pull the comps. I'll then pull that up. So, so I'm still doing this part of it, which I will outsource at some point, but I'll look at the comps and I'll figure out what I feel the ARV is based on the comps that are pulled. Um, then I'll do the, you know, I actually doing 65% of ARV at the moment, just because the market's been changing. Mm-hmm. I changed that um, about six, seven weeks ago. Um, used to be seventy percent, but sixty five percent of AAV minus repairs. Okay. I'll put that back as a as a maximum allowable offer, and then my acquisition specialist she'll relay that to the to the sellers. If we're in the same ballpark and they're aligned, then we'll set up an inspection. So so I have a person that goes and does the inspections for me. I used to do them, but they'll go out, they'll take the photos. Uh, they're actually a realtor as well. They'll they'll actually pull a second CMA for me just to like validate my comps. Um, nice. And that's, I was looking for an inspector, but this person happened to be a real estate agent. I'm like, you may as well do CMAs as well. Like, let's, let's do this. Um, yeah, right. And so then then that'll come back to me and then I'll just reset the numbers and make sure it still works. And if it works, contract it, let's go. If, if it doesn't work at the first point or at this point, then the acquisition specialist, she'll make the offer. So she actually goes back and makes the offers. She'll, I'll, she'll get the contract sent out and sign. If it's not a deal, it'll stay in her follow-up until the house is sold, you know, forever really. Um, so yeah, um, I'm sort of just looking at the numbers, watching, you know, I, I really do the marketing cause that's, that's my skill. Um, mm-hmm. and that's our team. So it's really one full-time person, one full-time person myself. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much full-time, I'm full-time in the business too. So there's me, her VA, the inspection person, he just, we pay him per inspection. Um, and that's, that's really how the business runs. Simple. So did you say, is your acquisition specialist US based? She's not a VA. She, she's, she's US based, which has been, okay. So, which is, I think a real advantage for me. Um, the, it, yeah. it, the, the nuance to why I did it because it obviously is more expensive. Um, but I, I'm here on a business investment visa. So part of the deal for me being here is I need to make an economic impact in the US, you know, so they oh, want me yeah. to hire, you hire somebody. So that's, that's why I hired a US person to start with, yeah. but I would do it again now because She's lot. She's awesome. Sure. She's been to me two and a half years now. She's been here, and, and she she's fully local. She has great convos. She's not a salesperson. So she knows the area. She's good. Yeah, and, and this is something. This is this is that. something that clicked on me too, right? So I I spoke to a lot of people because I did this all myself at first, and I obviously hired out afterwards. Mm-hmm. 
And when I was trying to figure out like how to hire my acquisition person, I asked a lot of people, a lot of people were commission only, and I think that works, but I, I made a conscious decision to pay a base, you know, mm-hmm. as well as commission. And I did that for a couple of reasons. I wanted, I didn't want them to stress. They weren't making, if they were stressed, I'm stressed, but I wanted to get more of a service oriented, like a talker. So, so she's not, mm-hmm. she's a good salesperson, but she's not, she's not selling her, her, her she's yeah. really good at rapport. So, you know, she's just speaking, talking, friendly. You know, she does a lot of training. Chris Voss, John Martinez, yeah. you know, so she just, uh, she's just listening. And she's also, uh, she's neutral, right? She's not, because she's not the one with the money, right? She's not writing the checks. You know, she's she's like middle person in and she's like, she wants, hey, I want to get you what you want. Let me see what I can do. So that works. Even when I was doing it, I would always say, let me check my partner. I would create like that layer of not being that person. So, but with her, it's legitimate. And that really works having that local person following up. I think it makes me stand out in the market. Uh, she's, she's a real weapon. Yeah, that's awesome. But she does have some form of commission. On yeah, her. she does. Absolutely. So, 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 so she's got a base, which is, you know, like, like it's it decent, but it's like, but, but she definitely incentivized by commission. She she gets paid on um, assignment fees. And if I keep it, she, she gets a, uh, paid on that as well. Yeah. So, so it's both. It's both. Nice. Nice. That's cool. So, um, I wanted to go back really quick because something you said there. So, you said that you get information from them and you do 65% of ARV minus repairs, which is pretty standard in this market. We're kind of mm-hmm. doing the same. Um, then you make an offer. And if you're in the basic range, then you go and get photos. What do you consider the basic range? That's always something that people ask us too. Yeah. Is they're like, because in wholesaling, right, a ten thousand dollar difference, that ten thousand dollars off your line, and even in like the big picture of a three hundred thousand dollar property, ten thousand dollars from an end buyer can make yeah. sense. But mm-hmm. from the wholesaler's perspective, that can be like the whole deal. You know, so so good, good question, uh, and it's pretty much the number I say, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so, okay. Okay. so okay. I sort of say in the range because it's probably the loose terms we use with the sellers. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. we're trying to, we're trying to say it's a ballpark number. Like we haven't seen the house yet. You know, I'm not, I'm not writing the contract based on that. I know some people do, but like, we just don't do that here. Uh, so I'm probably using that loose term, but it's pretty much got to be about the number I said, I might make some exceptions if they're like showing their moving and I feel like there's motivation. I might be five or so K off, you know, but I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not going to do an inspection unless we're pretty much there. Unless I think it's a deal. Um, Mm-hmm. If it's not, she'll keep following up. We like we will we'll keep working that lead. Like, but we're just not going out to the house. Um, because I used to go myself. So I'm like, I'm not going. Like, um, and I guess it just carried over to the inspection person now as well. Yeah, right. yeah. That that follow up piece is super huge too. I mean, the fortunes in the follow up so much. I mean, we've we've had people that you know, I don't know. We offer like two hundred, and they're like, I'm not selling for less than three hundred thousand. Right. And so we follow up with them for a year. And then finally, a year later, they're like, is your offer for 200 still available? Like, now we're at like 190 now. And they're like, okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Particularly in this market, too, right? Like, and and that, that just staying in front of people and she'll touch, she'll touch base at least every month, you know, and, and real soft. Right. Like, with like just real soft. Hey, following up, just, you know, how did you go? Did you end up selling State Street? You know, okay, you didn't, or you did, or you're like, and she just, She's feeling out, you know, and if, if, if they sort of open up to like, we're moving, if not, it's just, hey, cool. We'll, and she'll follow up again. And so then we just make sure that when they do finally hit that motivation point, like they know us, they're going to call us. They're not, they're not going back to try to go, they're calling us back. Yeah. What does your follow-up system look like? Is it like that she has like, hey, this is a warm lead or a hot lead or do you do you follow it up with like, hey, every month, no matter what we're calling or is it more rigid than that with texting, calling? We do, we do mainly, so so it's driven mainly, it's mainly like not, it's not so automated, it's not that automated um, in okay. terms of text and emails. She will go in and send some text and emails at different points, um, sure. but it's not automated to that respect. Uh, I use, I mean, I use Salesforce, uh, CRM for my old business. Really? So I, I built like sales systems and there's like, we oh. like, so, so like I, I, the way I do it, I don't think I'd recommend anyone else to do it. Like, it's not like 
this is the system. <laughs> but it's like, I did that for many years and built a significant set. I had 90 salespeople that worked for me, like, you know, like, and yeah. so I just do the same thing. And it's all everything, basically everything has a next call date, right? So there's a next call date. Oh, okay. And my, my acquisition person has a view that shows everything with a next call date of today or the past. And and yeah. that next call date will just get moved forward. Okay, I'm gonna call them in four weeks, four weeks, two weeks, you know, like a month. And it's just, so just every day that view and every day whatever is, is gonna come into that view and I can assign them and move them around and all that sort of stuff. But it's just, it's pretty simple. Um, and I didn't get too fancy. I do think people can make the mistake of getting too, like, like they're just starting out and they're, they're digging in Podio, doing all these automations. And it's like, mm-hmm. figure out what works first then automate it, you know? It's like sure. the perfect distraction yeah. though for people to not do the hard things, which is talking which to talk, sellers, talk to people, but, but still feel like they're doing a business where they're like just creating yeah. shit in their serum that doesn't yeah. actually do anything. Yeah. Right. Um, I've got, I've got, I've got this view, right? So like, like you know, my, our company was a tech company and you know, in tech it's like, you want to do an MVP. So MVP is minimal viable yeah. product, right? And you just, you want to test things. And because the problem most entrepreneurs have um, is they have all these awesome ideas, right? So you got these 10 fantastic ideas. Trust me, nine of them are shit. Right? <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, me, you, everyone, I'm not, I'm not saying you're right. My ideas are shit, right? So one, the ones that you think yeah. are awesome. And the biggest problem people yeah. have is like, I got this awesome idea. Cool. How do I do it? Well, and, they, and they, they've got this big system and they start building this big system. And it's like, at the end of that time, they build a system and spend this time and they realize it's shit and they wasted their time. So MVP is more like just cool. That's an awesome idea. What's the dirtiest, simplest way to just do that and test it, right? Because then you do it and you go, cool, didn't work. Okay, well, that actually was a shit. Next, that one didn't work, didn't work. Oh wait, that one worked. Okay, let's go, let's start building that system. Like, and, and like, and, that, and that's sort of how I approach things. Just, I'm not gonna build a big ass system. And then once you're doing it, now I can optimize. Now I, I, now I have data, I have, I can get in, I go, yeah, let's automate. Oh, you're doing, you're spending like an hour doing that. Let me automate that. Because like now I'm taking that off you, it's, but it's already a flow that's working. So that's just sort of how I view the world. And I think if you're just starting out, just keep it simple. We had a thing in a model business, everything started in a spreadsheet. Like we, we had, mm-hmm. do we ended up having like a 300 staff. I had data scientists, product managers, programmers, like we could build anything, but anything started in a spreadsheet. Just start it in a goddamn spreadsheet, get it moving, work it, and then build off, off that. Yeah, I think that's super so important. And in and, and off-market real estate as well, I think that that's... So we always do when we work with people, when we're, when we're in our instant investor program, is we say, what we want you to do is talking to sellers as early as possible. So, so many people are trying to like build these fancy brands and like mm-hmm. the website. I'm like, no, just start marketing, start talking to sellers because honestly, what might happen is you're going to get your ass chewed by your first angry person and you might suddenly realize this business is not <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it's going to be something that Absolutely. you have to learn how to deal with. Because well, and at that point, if you've downs, never yeah. talked direct to sellers, like your brand doesn't matter. Yeah, like if you no. suck at talking to sellers, doesn't matter what brand is, doesn't matter what CRM you have, doesn't matter anything. And talking to the sellers, the most important piece of it at that point in time. Absolutely, and I think when you start and you start, I think that's the best advice ever. Definitely, just get on the phone and talk to sellers. And I think the attitude for that is consider it practice. You know what I mean? Like, right. don't, because I think people all this pressure, oh, I don't want to, what if it's a deal and how, how will I contract it? And, and they're trying to solve all the problems. It's like, yeah. you know, it's not going to be a deal. Just, just, just practice. Yeah. Right. And if it happens to end up in a yes. deal, that's a bonus. But if, and then when they have that mindset, it's like, cool, we'll just do your hundred conversations. Just go do your hundred conversations. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get a deal. Don't even try it. Don't, don't, don't think about getting a deal. Have hundred conversations, come back and tell us how you went and what you found out, you know? Yeah, dude, I exactly. love that. Get your get your reps in. Don't don't have expectations. I mean, just get in there and talk to people. Who cares? Like we said earlier, who cares about the asset? Just talk to the person. No expectations. That's that's great advice. Exactly. Yeah, like it's like going back to the sports analogy. You don't go and try and do a one rep max back one rep max back squat on your first yeah. day. Like you know, go and learn the basic movement pattern first before yeah. you even go. And Hit the gym a few times. Get a few reps in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so no, that's cool. So before we get into our, our initial questions, did you touch on what your marketing in marketing platform? No, I didn't. Uh, so I'm mainly, I'm mainly like a on digital branded 
marketing is sort of what I would say. I started with texting, by the way, texting was like awesome. Like that's actually how I got my first deals and I found that really effective. Nice. Um, I did though start to see uh, like the laws changing and I, I think it's still working, but I, I, but my background is like digital marketing, like in brand. So like, so I'm like, I sort of saw it change. I'm like, well, I should use my strength, right? Like and, and build mm-hmm. that. So, you know, I do a lot of SEO, uh, SEM, you know, social media stuff, um, you know, and, and, and but branded as well, right? So my leads, I would imagine would convert a lot better than other people's because it's not just that I generate a lead, like they've seen me. If you go to my website, um, you see videos of me, you see video, you see hundreds of videos in houses. Like, like I do a video, every house we buy, look at, I'm just zero production, zero production value, right? I literally, I think I've done a, a second take once ever in my life, right? Just literally one take. I'm like, hey, Aussie Steve, home by Louisiana. Hey, we're at this house, we're buying the seller, and I'm just talking about what's going on. And it's like, it's it's not that, and there's hundreds of videos, right? And it's not that someone's going to look at all those wow. videos, but they'll look at one and they'll see that there's hundreds. And they'll go, yeah. okay, you know. Um, You're, that, that's actually really smart. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and get, take, take, we're going to take like four videos. I'm going to go and download all yours and put them all on my website. Yeah, exactly. so I see how <laughs> there's four of Mike's face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, that is smart though. Um, so I guess I was going to say that you have like a general tip for people to really capitalize on online marketing. Cause I would say that is one of the things that is very easy to spend a ton of money on and get nothing from. But the people who are good at it, they seem to do very, very well. Um, so I guess, what, like, what is your main tip for, for online marketing? So it's a good point, right? Because you, you need to be prepared to lose and learn. Because um, online marketing is about learning. Um, you know, I probably have an unfair advantage in, the, in my old business. Like, we spend a million dollars a month on Google Ads. Um, wow. So, so like... Uh, not that I, I mean, I, I, but I ran the market and I had people that ran those for me and stuff. So, uh, but we started, we used to spend, uh, two grand a month. It was two cents a click, two, two cents a click, man. Wow. Those were the good old, that was back in like 2007 or whatever. Um, and, <laughs> and what I what you learn is though, you're going to waste a bunch of money. You are, if you start, you're going to, you're going you're to spend money. It's not going to work and, but you need to optimize it. You will learn and you, you continue to train it. It gets better and better. Cause you learn that like certain, uh, assets aren't working, you know, certain ads aren't working. You stop using those ads. You, you, if you're targeting keywords, these keywords aren't converting, like I need to get rid of those keywords. I'll add negative. So, so you've got to be a little bit prepared to lose a bit of money, but as long as you need, and you need to pay attention to it and keep improving it. But if you stick with it, like over time, you'll get better and better and better. And then, you know, then those campaigns become really effective. So I think you just got to sort of stick with it, um, you know, and I just would say, you know, add some brand into your site um, and some personality to help with the conversions. Yeah. Wow. So, so that's your like main a, focus yeah. of marketing is online right now? Yeah, really, really online. Yeah, really online has been my focus. Um, you know, I've done a lot, I did a lot of mail in the past. I've done a lot of that. And, and my intention is I'm going to start doing that again soon. But uh, I like, you know, the, the brand and stuff, is just, it's, it's my skill. Like, it's what I've done. So it's, it's just right. the easiest thing for me to do. Um, and for me, if, and it, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a online marketing, but it's also the brand, right? So like, so like yeah. and you know, if you go look at my website, homebuyerlouisiana.com, do not copy my words, but definitely take inspiration um, from it, you know, and you, it, the brand helps and then it converts. And then as I add more marketing channels, it, like I, I send them all to my website anyway. If I if I do a direct mail, I'll link to my website. If we speak to someone, yeah. we'll end up sending that website. I'll, I'm I'm funneling you back there. I want you to see my website, even if you didn't come through my website. Right. I want you to see it. I want you to expose the brand, um, because most of the sellers we speak to, they obviously the number needs to match, but they sort of got the attitude of like, particularly with my sales acquisition person, she's so friendly too. So they see our site if they speak to her. Normally at the end of that call, like the feeling we want to get is, let me see if they can make, let me see if they can pay what I want because I want to work with them. And hopefully they're not calling everyone else. Yeah. And like, if we've done that job, they're like, they're not calling 10 people. They're going, okay, um, I still need to meet the number. They're not going to sell to me at any price, but like, but like, hopefully I've got that shot to go, 
let me see if I'm going to do business with them and if they can make the numbers work. And that's really my goal. Yeah, that's great. I love it. So, so it sounds like what you're saying at its base level is the best kind of marketing is the one that you were going to do consistently over a long period of time. You're going to measure your KPIs and what of what works and what doesn't and just tweak things as you can. 100%. Is that, and and, and, and yeah. definitely let me say that. Like, same with direct mail, any channel. Do, mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I'm in a tech company. We, we did online marketing. Like, like I'm, that's my natural instinct. If you have a different natural instinct, if you love the mail and the process of texting, like, like just stick with that. You know, it's not, it's not that online is the magic formula. It's that the consistency and the learning and the, you know, being familiar with it is, is what's going to make you really good at it. Yeah, exactly. And I think the biggest mistake so many people make is they try something for a month and it doesn't make them millions of dollars. So they jump to the next thing and they jump around and they do that repeatedly. And lo and behold, they never actually get any opportunities. Exactly. Um, right. So, no, good stuff, Steve. I love it. Um, all right. We're going to go into our end of show questions. So, um, first question, since you're a wholesaler, I'm excited about this one because yeah. uh, and, sure yeah, a wholesaler in New Orleans. A new in New Orleans, I'm sure you got all sorts of interesting characters like we do up here in um, North Idaho area too. Um, what is your craziest real estate investing story? And this can be a crazy seller. This can be a big win, a big loss. The only rule is you're not allowed to tell a story about someone that died in a property <laughs> because we got we went on like a streak of a bunch of those and it was just super depressing. Okay, wow. yeah. okay. I, I had bought some dead properties, but but, but well, the probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably the most interesting i mean there's some crazy stuff here and like i'm surprised how people can live and that's probably some things i've learned um oh, yeah. i've been shocked at now yeah. i'm no longer shocked um but probably the, the most interesting story was as i told you i was here for six months initially right i entered i had an airbnb um and then we started to stay i was looking at my visa we got a lease on the airbnb we spoke to sellers and we got a lease to stay for 12 months i started doing the wholesaling um, took me a while to get my first deal. I, I probably spent a good six months working really hard and I did my first, second, third, same week, right? And it wasn't that I did anything great that week. It was, it was the payback. It was the consistent action just all happened to fall in. But then that same week, the owner of that property, uh, reached out to me and he said, cause our lease was coming up and we were planning on renewing by the way, but he's like, he's like, uh, oh, your lease is coming up. Do you guys think you're going to stay? Cause like. Maybe because he lived in Chicago and he's like, uh, maybe, maybe like, I don't, we don't really want to manage it anymore. The Airbnb was a three plex, actually it's two long terms. We don't think we can manage it. Like, maybe do you guys want to buy it? I'm like, oh no, no, we like, no, we, we don't, the area's a bit rough. Not at all. Um, so, but like, I'm like, you yeah, dude, I'm going to, I'm going to buy it. Like, like yeah. I learned how to wholesale. I started doing my deals. I'm speaking to a out of state landlord who wants to sell. And I'm living in his goddamn house. If I can't do a deal, I do not deserve to be in real estate, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so I ended up negotiating. Um, I've got a lease option on it. Okay. So uh, and this, is a, this is uptown. It's quite a nice area. It's, it's zone commercial, Airbnb. It's quite a cool property. So I did a lease option on it. Um, two year lease option. Uh, the deal. Well, I pretty much paid market rent. Like it's pretty sorry market uh, market value for it, but I made 75% of my rent count as equity in the property because I, I, I was already paying it. We wanted to stay there. So, yeah. so I basically for two years converted that to equity. Um, obviously property prices went up a lot too, like, <laughs> you know, right. um, so the value went up a lot. I paid down a whole bunch of equity. Um, and I ended up closing on it, uh, beginning of this year, um, actually. Right. And now I've got it as an Airbnb and it's a threeplex uptown. It's like really awesome property. So I like that uh, literally the Airbnb that I came to this country and thinking for six months, I ended up buying it and keeping it. That's um, so cool. So, so I, I do like that story. Yeah. yeah, that is a really cool story. That's very cool. And structuring the debt like that as well, where you have so much money in principle. I mean, you basically did like a... I kind of slightly different because it was a lease to open, but like a seller finance with super low interest. Yes. Um, and a very yeah. favorable amortization. Yeah. So you don't get, like you don't get amortization like that, right? 75% of the, like that's, that's no, I really amortized that down. Like, like it, it was yeah, really massive. Good. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a, that's a sick deal. Um, all right. Second question. Um, what is the number one tip you would give to either a new investor looking to get started or a small time investor looking to take their business to the next level? 
I, I, for me, network is everything. I, my, my advice would be to go to the meetups, right? Like, uh, you know, I've, I've gained so much traction by just attending these meetups, meeting people. You know, if I think of some of the people I met when I first started four years ago, I like randomly read out, reached out and a few people met with me. Some of those people, we now have LLCs. We've, we own properties together. We, you know, like, like do a whole bunch of things together. So like, and that just came from attending these meetups and even other people that just, I draw on and property managers I use, like just get out, get to those meetups, meet people. Uh, I think that's the most powerful way to start becoming uh, more confident um, and, and, and growing your business. Yeah. Great advice. Absolutely. Network. Yeah. And I think, I think local network, but also national network as well is super powerful. Like we've, you know, cause you also just learn from being around people. Like this one of the reasons we started this podcast is because we can connect and learn with what people are doing in other places. And it's why, you know, Dan and I pay good money to be involved in different groups that are, you know, nationally based is because, you know, like you said, your network is, is everything at the end. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so awesome. much value in it. All right, Steve. Yeah. So, so last question: Where can people fi find you, follow you, and reach out to you if you'd like them to do so? Uh, like you can check my website, homebuyerlouisiana.com. You can contact me through there. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn under Stephen Keery. Uh, you, can, you can get me on Facebook. Actually, I'm. I, I used to keep Facebook strictly like my friends, but like I've, I've got so many real estate people now. So, so you can probably hit me. Yeah. <laughs> you can probably hit me through Facebook. Um, Okay. Um, Stephen Keery, you'll, you'll, you'll find me. Um, yeah. Cool. Perfect. You want to spell Keery? For yeah, yeah, because I, I, I don't want to do show for sure. <laughs> it's uh, K-E-I-G-H-E-R-Y. So K-E-I-G-H-E-R-Y. And that's Stephen with a P-H, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Perfect. Awesome. And we'll put all that in the show notes, but sometimes people don't have to yeah, look. So. Yeah. Um, right. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Steve. Um, really appreciate you hopping on the show. You're doing some cool stuff down there. And it's interesting to, like, I appreciate you coming on and having like a, a small operation with something that you're a truly an expert in with the online stuff. That's a very unique perspective that we haven't had yet. Everyone that, we're, that we usually have on is like either huge teams and like lots of stuff, or they are like, you know, like they're kind of like doing all the things, yeah. right? Which can be cool, mm -hmm. but also like, I mean, you make $4 million a year, but you have a 20% profit margin. Like I don't really care yeah. as much. Like, that's <laughs> right, someone yeah. that it, it is, is it, refined. It is funny because in my mind, like, like I said, my, my, my old company was like, we had 300 staff, I had 90 salespeople. So when I first started doing the wholesaling, like I was listening to like the all in guys in Arizona, the, like, they, and I was like, man, I can do that. Like, dude, like, like, uh, <laughs> and I wanted to at first, but then I've sort of changed my thinking and that like mm -hmm. I value, you know, more lifestyle as well. I don't want it. Dude, I had friends. It was the best thing ever, but like, I, like do it, y'all. But I've actually done it. Like we IPO'd. I don't, I don't need, like I build that big business. It's been successful. I've luckily yeah. have some capital from it. I'm like, what I've realized is I don't want to do that again. <laughs> so, so I'm sort of conscious around creating a, yeah. you know, like I want it to be successful and profitable and, but not, not a crazy beast. Um, I don't need to ride that Bronco again. Yeah. Yeah. And Good for you. I think that, yeah, I think the big takeaway too is that you don't need to do that to be successful. Cause that's also the other thing that a lot of people say is they like, I don't want to have a huge business. And the crazy thing is, is even though people go on podcasts and they tout that you don't have to be that. I, I am scared. You can still live I'm scared about those people over this part of the cycle, right? Too. Like that's, that's, a, you Honestly, know, right. I think being this size is pretty easy to adapt. And I, I think a bad cycle Absolutely. is actually exciting. Pretty far was running a massive team with a lot of overheads. I'm maybe less excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. You're a little more scared. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So awesome. Well, thanks so much again, Steve. We really appreciate it. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please go and share with anyone who has any interest in real estate, wholesaling, business, or just hearing to um, an Australian guy and two dumb American guys just <laughs> chit chat for what are we at? 48 minutes. Yeah. So um, share it though, seriously with anybody, that's the easiest way to grow the show. And it really does help us out a ton. And if you want to start finding off market profits for yourself, you can go to collecting keys, slash free and get our free five-step guide to start generating off market leads. It's a great way to just sort of jump into the action. It's a super short read and it will let you know everything you need to know to start finding deals. So awesome guys. Well, thanks so much for listening and we'll talk to y'all next week. See ya.